Watch these brilliant secret interrogation tactics crack this guy, Colonel Russell Williams, into finally confessing his underwear murders. Find out what they are next. Welcome back to the channel, Shakers. Derek Van Shake here. Colonel Russell Williams was the 46-year-old Canadian Air Force pilot who for three years broke into 82 neighbors' homes, stealing women's underwear and then photographing himself with it on. However, he escalated his crimes from breaking into homes and stealing underwear to assaulting women in their homes and eventually two murders. Russell Williams was given two life sentences for first-degree murder and many more years for his assaults and breaking and entering. Russell was an up-and-coming military officer and even occasionally flew for the British royal family which helped them get away with this for so long. The Ontario Provincial Police blanketed Cozy Cove Lane. When they got to Russell Williams' door, there was no answer. The officer moved on to the Jones house. He says, who lives next door? I said, uh, Russ Williams. He says, well, I guess no sense looking at that guy then. At this point, when Russell walks into the police station, he believes that he's mostly being questioned about his neighbor because the police mistakenly arrested his next door neighbor as their prime suspect. You're saying that I'm a suspect? You are our, our suspect. I said, you gotta be kidding. However, now, unbeknownst to Russell, the police have tire track evidence that point right at him. There were tire tracks preserved by the cold. Set up roadblocks checking the tires of cars on Highway 37. One of those they stopped was Colonel Russell Williams. They checked his tires, then let him go. Unbeknownst to Williams, he was under police surveillance from then on. So in what many call a brilliant interrogation, they finally got Russell Williams to confess to the murders. But how did they do it? We're going to break down police interrogation tactics along with analyzing Russell's body language to finally reveal their interrogation secrets of how they cracked a high-ranking military officer into finally confessing. Now, let's get started. All right. I'm just to see Russell. Meet our interrogator, Jim Smith. He just escorted Russell into the interrogation room and they're making some small talk to increase their friendly rapport. Going straight into interrogating is not a good approach because the suspect is not gonna tell the interrogator his deepest and darkest secrets to someone he doesn't feel understands him, relates to him, or even likes him. That's a little microphone, just to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed. Oh, no? Such a wide smile here from Russell. Yes, he smiles to the camera, seemingly gloating that he's just gonna talk to the interrogator for a little bit and get the police to continue to accuse his next door neighbor for his crimes and then drive home for dinner with his wife. You'll surely notice his body language slowly change from what we see here. Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. I guess the closest to interviewed by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh yeah? Can you guess why he said that? Yes, it was surely to intimidate the interrogator of his government status. And to remind interrogator Jim that he's highly trusted by the military and the police should trust him too. Keep in mind, if we just heard him say that without knowing the other evidence and body language to come, we probably wouldn't think too much of it independently. That's why it's important to look for clusters. All right, well again, Russell, I appreciate coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Russell gives off a lot of fake smiles and nervous smirks, which you're surely noticing. We know they're fake and nervous because they come and go quickly. The afternoon. And they seem to be done to appease the interrogator to get on his good side. Sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're gonna do a pretty thorough interview today, okay? okay. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Um, Russell is not only nervously chomping away on that gum like a cow, but he's also making an abnormal amount of appeasing grunting in what seems to be convincing and not just conveying. Right, there's many signals already that indicate that he's oddly extremely nervous. However, is he just paranoid that the police will frame him for something he didn't do, or is he actually guilty? So what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're... Uh, 
a coffee guy or not, but I didn't guy. want to drink yeah. in front of you, so. No, I appreciate um, that. Interrogator Jim offers Russell a cup of coffee for several reasons. First, caffeine will increase his anxiousness, getting him to talk. Second, it's a small, unexpected gift, which will increase the interrogator's goodwill with Russell. In your own life, don't your loved ones seem to appreciate the small, unexpected gifts more than the large, expected gifts? Third, those goodwill feelings by offering that small gift will hopefully cause Russell to not want to lie to interrogator Jim. Fourth, it creates feelings of reciprocity in Russell. When you accept an unexpected gift from someone you just met, how do you feel? Maybe a little indebted to them, like you owe them something back? Fifth, it creates strong mirroring body language of them both sitting down, sipping a cup of coffee together, and having a casual chat. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, they probably found out that he loves coffee, and they set all that up just for him. Sorry, what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. piece, piece of gum <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. But he turns down the coffee because he would rather nervously chop away on his gum instead, turning that into another signal of how nervous he is. Choosing old gum he had in his mouth for several minutes over a nice, fresh, hot cup of coffee. I didn't want to drink in yeah. front of you. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again... Uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat people, everybody with respect. I don't know why I ask if they do the same for me. The interrogator talks about treating each other with respect. Did you notice that he didn't ask that Russell is truthful? Do you know why? Right, that would have come across as accusatory, assuming that Russell will lie. Everyone gets offended when assumed to be a liar, even a liar. Also, this will allow the interrogator to confront Russell with breaking his promise to be respectful when he surely does lie, which will make Russell feel like a dishonorable person for breaking his promise to the nice man who was so thoughtful to surprise him with a hot cup of coffee. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? It's always important to mention that the suspect doesn't have to say anything here. Also remember, at this point, Russell can walk out of that police station go home and have dinner with his wife. But what would happen if he did that? Right, they would get a warrant for his arrest and then he'll be back in that same chair within a day or two where he can either try and talk his way out of the evidence like he's doing now or he can shut his mouth and hire a lawyer. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tui. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was... Uh, was very close. Russell proactively and defensively talks about the crimes like he's a concerned neighbor. Although it's quite obvious he's involved, even if you just look at the pattern. Because every neighborhood Russell moves into, all of a sudden women complain of their underwear being stolen from their homes. Now listen to what the interrogator does. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about, okay? Um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of... Uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Yes, when Russell was proactively and casually talking about the case, the interrogator takes that as a partial admission of guilt. A connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Now see if you notice anything odd in his response. Would you agree? A completely innocent person would become very angry that they're being accused of something so unthinkable, wouldn't you? However, to a guilty person like Russell, it's not unthinkable because he actually did it. Interrogator Jim says, Would you agree? In a very strong and confident tonality, essentially beginning the confessing process. However, Russell isn't going to follow the lead that easily. So listen to what Interrogator Jim does to get a yes out of Russell. Geographically, yeah, I guess or... I drive past, uh, yes, I, I would yes. have to say there is a... A connection, yeah. Right, he clarifies and makes it more specific just to get him to agree. It's important to keep Russell on the yes path, going along with what the interrogator says. But notice Russell isn't angry, agitated, or offended at all that he's now a top suspect. And remember, this is not did he steal the candy bar from the corner deli. Russell is sitting there rationalizing with the interrogator of why it makes sense for him to be a top suspect. I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, called yeah. me. Um, do you remember how you found out? Corporal Marie Franz actually worked under Colonel Russell at his base. And if you don't know, Corporal is lower on the military totem pole, while Colonel is extremely high, just under a general. So I got an email, I can't remember if it was late at night or early in the morning, but certainly I saw it, uh, I want to say first thing in the morning, because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for, um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what, what day of the week we're talking about, but, uh, 
Yeah, no, I mean, obviously when your people gets killed, it uh, gets your attention. Did you notice his odd out of place smile, which appears to be duping delight? Also, did you notice how he oddly tried to downplay it? Obviously when your people gets killed, it uh, gets your attention. This was not just any death of someone in his command. It was rare and gruesome and everyone on the base at this time knew it too. Again, this is another major red flag for this interrogator that Russell is oddly downplaying what happened to one of his people. He wrote a letter of condolence to her family saying, please let me know whether there is anything I can do to help you during this very difficult time. He didn't attend the funeral. How did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Did you notice interrogator Jim is somewhat mirroring Russell? Yes, he's likely doing that intentionally to get into rapport with Russell. So he will subconsciously feel that Jim understands him more. Would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. Okay. Did you notice the interrogator said footwear impressions last? Fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that. After he got yeses out of Russell for the first two more conventional types of samples. Footwear impressions. Yeah. What Russell doesn't know is that they have his frozen footprints in the snow at one of his victim's houses. And they're hoping that Russell was stupid enough to wear the same boots he wore to commit the crimes to the police station to deny the crimes. What do you think? Was Russell actually that stupid? Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible. Yeah. Because, uh... You know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. If you notice, Russell seems more concerned of what others might think of him, and not that he's a prime suspect for doing these horrific things. At this point in desperation, he reminds the interrogator of his military status, likely hoping that would cause them to tread more lightly when they're investigating him. Bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military would certainly be of great assistance for to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Miss Comel's investigation. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. Interrogator Jim basically said it's Sunday, so don't worry about it. Russell knows his only choice now is to talk his way out of this, which is why he's talking. It's a long shot, but at this point, if he doesn't talk, he'll likely be arrested immediately. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. Another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about... Uh, um, Things like extramarital affairs, mm -hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm -hmm. Did you see what Russell is doing? Right, he's nodding his head like a bird when Jim is telling him these things that should be completely ridiculous, irrelevant, and offensive if he were completely innocent. But Russell can't feel what an innocent person feels. And the interrogator knows this, so he's throwing logic at Russell to get him nodding in agreement. Because it all makes logical sense based on how he currently feels. Which not only points to Russell's guilt, but also continues to build that pattern of Russell agreeing and going along with the interrogator. Is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of? Now see what you think of Russell's body language here when he verbally responds. Anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why if, if your DNA is found it would help us understand why it may be there? Absolutely not. Okay. Yeah, massive nervous body language of almost everything in the book. He starts out with a nervous smirk and then a nervous adjustment in his seat right when he denies it and goes back into self-comforting defensive body language by recrossing his arms. He denies it in a nervous breathy tonality. Absolutely not. Okay. Because his sudden elevated heart rate has caused his breathing rate to increase. And did you notice that massive nervous gulp? DNA has become more and more precise to the point where when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for 30 seconds, yeah. walked out. CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh, quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Some people think CSI needs a blood splatter to match DNA, but that's not the case anymore. Russell now realizes that since they have his DNA sample, they're going to find his DNA in every one of the stranger's houses Russell claimed he was never in. He's now starting to come to the realization that he's getting caught with hard evidence. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think, um, I think they're toil. You recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so of that was? That was her house. That was her house. Okay. Yeah. So you remember that location? Yep. Yeah. Has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all? Um, 
for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So, yeah, yeah. is there anything you can remember doing that caused you to to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of roadway? No. Investigators already have his tire tracks around Jessica Lloyd's house that matches tires and vehicle. But Russell doesn't know that yet because they need his full denial first. So when further evidence is revealed, he can't all of a sudden make up something bogus like, Oh, now I remember. I drove off the road at that point to shoot at a rabbit with my sidearm, Dukes of Hazard style. Would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property, uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks? looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. They identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah, and recall seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field uh, to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house. Uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay. okay. What he saw was an SUV parked in a field some distance both from the road and from the nearest house. Just didn't seem right like there was should have been there. Your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very, very close to the width of the uh, of the tires uh, that were left in that field. Notice how drastically different Russell's body language is here from when he first started. You ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed. Oh, no. He started out gloating, surely thinking in and out and back for dinner. But now he's defeated and defensive because he's realizing he's getting caught. We're working on this file, so there's a lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue. Okay? okay? I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. When interrogator Jim comes back into the room, he states his disappointment and also shows his disappointment by speaking to Russell while not looking at him. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. But is Jim actually disappointed in Russell? Not really, because that was all part of the plan the whole time. It was even obvious from the initial evidence and the way Russell was acting that he was involved. Interrogator Jim was so laid back and came across as such a pushover, right? I'm big coffee guy. All right, go ahead. I treat everybody with respect. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, um, And essentially, uh, we have no issues with that. Can you think of any reason? Um, are you familiar with how C uh, DNA works? Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? And then you left Tweed in the morning and drove up to your meeting in Ottawa. Yeah. Okay. Very few suspects will ever confess to the nice pushover good cop who will believe everything they say without ever experiencing their bad cop persona. So they didn't actually expect Russell to walk in there and confess without ever experiencing bad cop. We talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want I want you to see what I mean. All right. This is not the classical interrogation strategy we've seen before. Typically, the interrogator goes hard and then soft within the same conversation, going from good cop to suddenly bad cop, making the suspect want to confess to the good cop to avoid the bad cop persona. But this strategy here was to go soft on Russell for hours, first seeking to understand Russell so he feels he gave his side completely. But he gave it blind to most of the hard evidence that's out there, which bad cop has. And when interrogator Jim came back this time, he ambushes Russell with the unexpected bad cop persona by laying out all the hard evidence to get him to confess here. This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is a photocopy of the boot that, uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. These are identical. Yes, Russell was stupid enough to wear the same boots into the police station that he committed the crimes in. If this wasn't real life, no one would actually believe anyone would be that stupid. If you recall, even dummy Chris Watts threw away everything he wore to commit the crimes and cover up the crimes. Did you pack new clothes? How did that work? I already have some in there. I have like two pairs of boots. But as we'll notice, Russell is an extremely sloppy criminal, and it's shocking that he didn't get caught much sooner. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Here's bad cop in action. We didn't see that side of interrogator Jim before. Now watch for Russell's response. Okay, you want discretion. We need to have some honesty 
right? Russell was taken off guard and got him speechless by surprising him with the evidence. And he's surely trying to come up with an excuse, but the longer he's speechless, the more implied guilt he's creating. Because what would a completely innocent person say? Well, first, this is very solid evidence. But if the person were somehow innocent, they would still deny it was them. Okay, because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Interrogator Jim mentions a lack of honesty and how things are getting out of control really fast. Can you guess why he said that? First, if you recall, they agreed beforehand to respect one another. I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's, uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat people, everybody with respect. I don't know why I ask if they do the same for me. And lying is a clear violation of that agreement. Second, Russell is a high-ranking military officer. Militaries in the free world typically believe in the honor code of not lying, cheating, or stealing, or at least the perception of following that very strictly. If he were to lie here when all the evidence clearly points right at him, he would be publicly saying he doesn't have any honor. Third, the interrogator uses the phrase out of control really fast. Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. That was intentionally said because Russell is a military pilot. Pilots typically seek control in their lives because as you can imagine, flying aircraft when things are getting out of control really fast is extremely dangerous. Interrogator Jim knew exactly what to say to Russell to hit him hard at the core of who he is. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. Well, I don't know what to say. That's, um... Well, you need to explain it. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence until your wife now knows what's going on and your vehicle's been seized, okay? You and I both know that the unknown offender male on Marie France Como's body is going to be matched to you quite possibly before the evening's over. See how everything turned? Interrogator Jim and the team that's surely watching this in the back room took Russell by surprise. They let Russell say all of his lies first, they held back a lot of their evidence, and now they're unloading all their evidence and the earth-shattering news onto Russell in what's called stacking. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm. He's making Russell feel the urgency of confessing, as if his aircraft is quickly spiraling down out of control towards the terrain. And he needs to act quickly to save it, because there's no time to call a lawyer. The investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. Their main concern is to find the missing person, who they suspect is sadly dead, but they don't know for sure. Their biggest priority is finding Jessica Lloyd, so they need him to begin confessing. They can't risk him shutting his mouth, calling a lawyer, and testing his luck with the jury. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This this is the practical steps in an investigation like this. And Russell. Also, one of the reasons why they chose this ambush interrogation tactic on Russell was to create this type of pressure and urgency to confess, reducing the chances that he'll shut his mouth and hire a lawyer. And if he did that, they may never find Jessica Lloyd. Russell, mm -hmm. listen to me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? Can you guess why interrogator Jim said that? Right, it's to let Russell know that he is not alone and Jim is someone who will understand Russell. So he'll be more likely to speak openly about what happened. Murderers usually feel alone and misunderstood after the crime. So what they want more than anything is to actually talk about what they did to someone who can empathize with them so they don't feel alone and misunderstood. Now listen to how Jim sells Russell on confessing. The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? If the truth comes out after the clear evidence 
is presented to you. Interrogator Jim is selling Russell on all the benefits of confessing now to get ahead of the hard evidence. So it doesn't come across in the news and in sentencing that he only came clean weeks later after all the evidence was so overwhelmingly against Russell. What are we going to do? You know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Russell, of course, knows the option interrogator Jim is talking about. But then why did he say it? Russell is subconsciously asking Jim to sell him further on confessing. Jim realizes this. So watch this. Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. Yes, he flips it to make Russell realize that confessing is the best option available to him right now. Because as bad as confessing may seem, not confessing will be a lot worse. In my previous video in the Jody Arias confession, this was a major mistake by the interrogator. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. And I say, I did it. Mm -hmm. I mean. The motive is there. The jealousy issue. Jody kept implying what's in for her to confess to it now as opposed to fighting this in court. But the interrogator didn't understand what Jody was asking him and never sold her on confessing. I might be wrong. Because okay? don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety got off on it, got off on having that label, Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. Now giving Russell some form of positive expectations to live up to, so he begins confessing and telling his story. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. He then creates more positive expectations for Russell to live up to with that bogus claim. How do we know that's bogus? Because Jessica Lloyd is missing and they need to find her. So they would be back in that interrogation room with anyone they believe knew where a missing person was. But Russell, of course, gives off a smile and a nod, indicating that he accepted the compliment. Interrogator Jim knows Russell surely has some level of psychopathy, which indicates Russell has a very fragile self-identity, causing him to believe fake compliments without question. Yes, as I said a few times in my previous videos, psychopaths are very easy to manipulate. Because of their lack of empathy, their blind spots are massive. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. Then Interrogator Jim pulls that little compliment that Russell just smiled at away from him. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is known as the push-pull tactic. The push is the praise and the pull is taking back that praise, getting Russell to chase after what he felt like he just lost. So in order to get back what he just lost, he has to confess to the crimes. You can use this push-pull tactic in your own life when you're either trying to sell someone on something or trying to influence someone. I'll probably make a future video on how to do that on my business channel. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where... Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. See what he's doing? He's giving Russell the idea that he can possibly go from being the villain in all this to now feeling like the hero. But I want to be clear, Russell is the farthest thing from a hero. But because psychopaths have such fragile self-identities, which rely heavily on other people's perception of them, feeling like the hero who led police to the missing person is extremely appetizing to someone like Russell. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we gonna do? A lot of people get very anxious in long periods of silence. where they feel like they have to fill in the silence with speaking. But for an interrogator, silence is extremely effective because it allows for anxiety to build in the guilty suspect. Feeling like the clock is ticking in their mind, pressuring them to speak. Russell. What are we going to do? Call me Russ, please. Okay. What are we going to do, Russ? Russell is coming to terms that he's now caught and realizes he's going to be spending the rest of his life behind bars.
Jessica somewhere where we can find her easily. Did you notice what interrogator Jim asked? Yes, that's the most important thing right now. There's a missing person and they need to find her. They don't want to hear his story on how he did it and why he did it. They need to find the missing person first. Also, just in case he stops talking and asks for a lawyer, they at least have the missing person, which will naturally include evidence that will be used to convict Russell. Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her? Or is this something where we have to go and... and uh, Take a walk. Russ, maybe maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with? What's the issue you're struggling with? As you can imagine, beginning to confess something that will put you in prison forever surely feels like taking the first step of walking off the side of a tall building. Just getting him to start talking about his deepest and darkest secret that will surely put him in a smelly cage for the rest of his life is the hardest part. Because once he starts confessing, there's really no turning back. But then why would someone confess and not fight it? It's because the interrogator makes it clear that confessing is the better option. And that's what Jim is continuing to do here. It's hard to believe this is happening. Why is that? Why is it hard to believe? It's just, it's just hard to believe. When you talk about perception, my only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah and the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. Major progress, right? He's finally subtly and verbally admitting his involvement. It's a start, but based on his initial perception comments, he seems more concerned about his wife's perception of him and what the Canadian forces will think of him. Also notice here, and going forward when he confesses, he doesn't seem to show any remorse for all the people he's hurt. I'm concerned that they're tearing apart my wife's brand new house. So am I. But if nobody tells him, what's there and what's not, they don't have any choice. Is he really concerned for his wife? Hardly, since we know Russell has very little empathy. Because if he did, he simply wouldn't be capable of committing the crimes we know he committed. Peters will be brought to Microsoft in California. They'll be, they'll be picked apart. You can't erase things from computers. They sell programs that, uh, to try and help people clean their computers of stuff and our guys are pulling that stuff out all the time. The FBI is pulling that stuff out all the time. Letting Russell know this is very effective on him because they know from the victims who survived, the perpetrator, Russell, photographed and even video recorded what he was doing. The evidence that they would find on his computer and memory cards would surely be overwhelmingly against him. This investigation will end up costing no less than $10 million. Easy. Any request, they've already been told, it's approved. Don't even bother asking. Minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Okay. Okay. So where is she? Get a map. Right here, there's no turning back for him. They got Russell to crack. Is she close to where she lives? I've got maps of that general area. If you notice throughout, especially when Russell reveals the gruesome details, interrogator Jim is very calm, not surprised, or judgy at all. Because if he were to show any negative emotion, what do you think would happen? Right, Russell would stop talking freely. I'm not sure if he gave me a map of, um, that covers Caligar down to the highway. Where am I going on, the, uh, on here to get to her? In this block here. A detailed map of that area and I'll show you where she is. I'll break back. How long has she been there for? A little over a week. Russ, you're doing the right thing here. Okay. Why do you think Jim gave Russell that handshake saying, you're doing the right thing? A lot of reasons. First, to show camaraderie and trust that they're going to work through what happened together. So Russell is more likely to speak openly to Jim about everything. Second, to essentially seal the deal that Russ will confess tonight. So he doesn't change his mind and go hire a lawyer. Third, by saying you're doing the right thing is rewarding him so he continues to speak truthfully. Changing his self-identity from doing the wrong things for so long into a positive self-identity by doing what's right by telling the truth. Now notice how Russell is even more helpful. In one of the top two drawers and there's a plastic divider inside there there are two memory cards okay which are blank but you'll be able to draw images of uh, Jessica and I what about Marie 
slick, right? A deliberate skip, assuming that he committed that murder too, even though Russell didn't admit to it yet. Jim wanted to make sure he got that whole confession confirmed while Russell was speaking honestly here. When someone is speaking openly and honestly, it's difficult for them to suddenly lie. There may be images on there as well. And the two women from September. And one more deliberate skip to make sure that Russell confesses to all the most serious charges against him. Yep. Want anything to eat or anything? But I do want to talk to you again. Yeah. That's the plan. Okay. Russell only wants to talk to Jim. He surely feels comfortable, respected, understood, and even liked by Jim. A suspect is not going to want to open up to an interrogator, revealing his deepest and darkest secret if he feels the interrogator hates him. I'll be talking more about this interrogation on my more channel, so you may want to subscribe to my more channel so you don't miss out on additional insight into this brilliant interrogation. And he walks across his lawn. I says, oh, just go on Partridge Hunt, Russ. I said, well, that's East Hungerford Road. I said, just go there past Kerry Road, and that's where Huncap is. Oh, really? Well, anyway, I'm just heading to work. I'll see you later. How far off the road is she? 40 feet. She's wrapped up. And she's on the surface. The next morning, Williams directed police to the body. It was the very location Jones had described to Russell Williams. There's lots of roads way back in the boonies that you could put a body on and nobody would ever find her. But no, he had to pick the road that goes to my hunt camp. Sounds like he's trying to set me up, eh? Give this video a thumbs up so I know to make more of these interrogation breakdowns. Although Russell received over two life sentences, he will actually be eligible for parole after spending only 25 years in prison. So in the comments, what punishment do you think Russell should have gotten? Let everyone know in the comments below. If you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button now because we don't want you to miss out on new body language and investigative videos that always seem to shake up YouTube. And I'll see you at the top. What do you want to talk about? I guess it's uh, pretty wide open now. Right? Yeah. What do you want to know? Why don't we start with Jessica? How does that start for you? She was in the basement, window wide open, on a treadmill. So I drove by. I was looking to see who was, who was where. So I was just keeping my eyes open. You went back on the Thursday night, right? Yep. She was out, got in through the kitchen window, everything else was locked. So you were in there doing what? Looking around to see who lived in the house. It was just her. Well, I left the house and she came home. had been out of the house very long. So I watched for a little bit to see if she was alone. She was. And then I went in and she went back to sleep through the uh, back patio door while she was uh, sleeping. So I woke her up, didn't, um, didn't hit her. I snuck up to the side of her bed, expecting to try to knock her out. She woke up, but she did as I said. What did you say? So lie down on your tummy. She did. I tied her up. Would you tie her up? Rope I brought. Are you in any of these pictures? Yep. And what kind of images are you in? Well, I'm with her on the hard drives. You'll see there's video as well. Almost four hours, I guess. So I was running the video and then taking still pictures. So the video pretty much covers everything. Did you use video at other places? At uh, Marie France's as well. Marie France, uh, Como. You remember why you that you thought to do that? She had said she lived alone the one time I met her. So you go to her house, and what do you do that night, the first night? Side basement window. Side basement window. But I could see that it was not locked. It had been open slightly. So I removed the screen, slid it open, went in, and then looked around and uh, made sure that she was living there alone. Do you do anything that night? Yeah, I was playing with her uh, underwear, wearing it. Did you take any of the underwear with you that night? Yeah, a few pieces. Was it clean? Was it used? For clean. Uh, what time do you think you got there? About 11 or so. She was on the phone in her room. You could hear that uh, from the backyard. I got in through the uh, side window. Same basement window? Mm -hmm. She actually discovered me in the basement. She was trying to get her cat to come upstairs and the cat was in the basement had seen me and was fixated on me in the corner. She couldn't get the cat up. She came downstairs trying to get the cat and I'm not weren't sure why she uh, came over to me. I guess the cat was staring at me, and she was wondering why the cat was staring at me. Lights were on. I was hiding behind the furnace, so she spotted me right there. And what is she wearing at that point? She wasn't wearing anything to start with. So when she came down to the basement, she had no clothes on? Mm -hmm. She had some sort of a shawl over her shoulder. Okay. And she immediately dropped when she saw me. Did she say anything when she saw you? She did. She called out, you bastard. Did she recognize you? No, I had uh, stuff on my face. So when she spotted me, I had the same flashlight. It's a red uh, three double D, but it's a metal, you know, one of these aluminum. I subdued her. Some tape. What kind of tape was it? Duct tape. Did she ever recognize you through this whole episode? No. What did you say you had on your face? I had just a, 
a cover for my head. Just a little cap kind of thing. Just a headband over my nose and mouth. Covered most everything but my eyes. Did you take anything out of uh, Marie France's house or Jessica Lloyd's house? Uh, yeah, some of their uh, underwear. The lady that lived closer to you? First one, mm -hmm. I had just spotted her from our boat, actually. So you go in, and how'd you get into her house? Side window. Cut the screen, slid the window, curled in. And where do you find... Uh, in bed, sleep. Notice that she was alone. And what do you do? Stood over her for a while, and I... Uh, Subdued her, mostly just my weight on top of her. Do you remember her saying anything to you? Um, all kinds of things. Took some pictures, took some of her underwear and left. You didn't go into her house before that, that night? No. The 76 Cozy Cove. How did you uh, decide on her? I knew she lived alone. And how did you know that? She was three doors down. I didn't know her, but I knew she was pretty alone. She had a boyfriend, hadn't seemed to be, hadn't been around. But she told me that they were fighting, so that's why I hadn't been around. Did you look in her house before the night that this uh, this incident happened? When did you yeah, do that? I had been in within the week. I looked around to see if there were any permanent signs of her boyfriend, I guess. Took uh, one or two pieces of her underwear, that's all. Well, the night you go there, when the incident happens... I probably got into the house around midnight. The window in the back of the house. I had to remove the screen and, uh, and slide it up. So I got into the house and uh, she was asleep in front of the TV. We struggled, subdued her with my weight, took some pictures, left. She was probably in the house about two and a half hours. Yeah, we talked. I uh, told her I wasn't going to hurt her. I told her that there were other guys in the house robbing her. My job was just to control her. Have you spent much time thinking about that? About why? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the answers. Let me ask you this. Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. I had met Maddie Thomas that one time. Let's talk about Jessica because she was there with you for the whole day. What kind of feelings were you experiencing while you were with her that day? Oh, she was a very nice girl. Can you tell me why you killed her? Because I knew that uh, her story would be recognized because she knew I was taking pictures. Two lived, right? And two died. What's, what was the difference in your mind between? The attention the first two got was very much focused on pictures I took. So anybody else telling stories about pictures, right, would have been a straight line. How do you feel about what you've done? Disappointed. If for whatever reason you didn't end up on our on our radar, so to speak, uh, do you think it would have happened again? I was hoping not, but I can't answer.